everyone. My name's Christina Newhart. I am a designer and a publisher of Filipino children's stories. Um, today I'm going to talk about the making of one of those books. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about, just quickly, about the making of one of those stories. So my press is called Sorry Sorry Storybooks. Um, the mission of the press is to parlay design via children's book publishing into elevating and making more visible Filipino culture. So my press has published four titles. Each book is written to a different part of the Philippines and elevates that region's language, culture, and themes. So the story we're going to talk about today is the one on the end, Kalipai and the Tiniest Tick Tick. And it's about the friendship between a little girl and the scariest monster in Philippine folklore. At least, I think it's the scariest. Um, have people in the audience heard of a Tik Tik or Manananggal or Aswang? Show of hands. Which one? OK, every, or two, <laughs> a few. The rest of you get ready, because, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, when I had the idea to make a children's book using the Tik Tik, you know, you might be wondering, as other people ask me, like, why would you do that? Um, and other people also said, you know, I understand wanting to do a book about Filipino folklore, but there's so many other monsters to choose that just scare kids and like don't try to eat them. Um, so why not do one of those? Um, and I was really attracted to doing a book with the Tik Tik. And I think for two reasons. One is, um, you know, the dark monsters are what are interesting. Um, they are where the juice is, um, they're magnetic. And they are metaphors for the things we don't want to talk about. They are, uh, represent the other. And that makes them really useful storytelling devices. So that was very attractive. Um, and then the other reason was cultural equity. Um, a lot of people were saying, you know, this is just a really gross, creepy monster. Oh, and a little backstory: she splits in half. She has the bat wings and the long tongue. And she likes to eat babies and fetuses. So she's pretty gross, as monsters go. Um, <laughs> But I still felt like I know that, but yet, you know, the brain-eating undead and the count that will suck your blood, this is something that's been um, translated into popular culture and we accept. So I think I felt that um, we're, we're accepting of the familiar demons. And so to me, it was another um, way of, um, pushing cultural equity through these books to make a book that had a monster from Philippine folklore. So there were two versions of this book. The second version is the one that was published. Um, the first version um, was not successful. Um, there were three reasons why I think um, for that. Um, it had a, I went for an edgy, cute illustration style. I was really committed to not erasing the monster quality of um, the Tick Tick. I didn't want to Disneyfy the creature. I think that's kind of a fine line when you're translating a monster into children's story. You can always make it cute and palatable, but then you erase the thing that makes it a monster in the first place. Um, so I wanted to ride that line with a, a little bit of an edgy illustration style. Um, the story centers parent-child relationship in the story as a theme, and the hero attempts to eat the, her best friend's baby brother. So I think for those three reasons, um, it didn't work. And I think because when it comes down to it, um, it's not right for the age group, which is five to eight years, five to eight year olds. So this is a look at that first book. Um, I looked for an illustrator with a, a beautiful dark style um, that could be adapted into a kid's book. And uh, I found a wonderful illustrator, Anne Rosario. So this is her character sketch for uh, Gamay, uh, the Tick Tick. So she's really cute, and she's got a little teeth. So she hit the mark on um, illustrating the story. But, um, and she had a really beautiful, intricate, textured style that I loved. Um, but you know, this is where it goes too far. Um, <laughs> and she tries to eat her friend's baby brother. And the, it's resolved by uh, her trying vegetarianism in the story, but she's not thrilled about it. Um, so it, it just doesn't work. Um, I showed it to um, friends and parents, and it was mixed, um, a mixed reaction. Um, 
Some people thought it was fine, um, but the strongest pushback I got were from a couple of Filipino American parents living in California. And when you're you know, looking at a, a product like a Filipino children's book line, that's a very important target market. So that made me <laughs> uh, hit the pause button and um, do more research and rethink what, how I could adapt the story. Um, so I talked to friends who work in children's media and children's um, educational development, and I got two pieces of helpful feedback. One is that a major theme for kids at that age is friendship. And the second piece of feedback is the hero can't be dangerous. Um, and both of those could be different for an older group, but for five to eight year, year olds, that's two important pieces of information that shaped the second version. So I looked for an illustrator with a beautiful, dreamy, soft style. Um, the story centers unconditional friendship and acceptance. And the hero is a vegetarian from the beginning. So um, that neutralizes her. And interestingly, it doesn't erase her nature because we meet other tic tics in the story who are not vegetarian. So interestingly, it, it helped the story in that way. So when I was looking for illustrators, um, I ran across this wonderful design studio in Cebu City called Happy Grahe. And looking at their work, especially the, the little girl and the sleeping monster, I thought, you know, they could really do this. They could do a version of the story that will make it, um, will give it that quality of dreaminess and sweetness. So they're founded by a husband and wife team, Mark and Joanna Deutsch. And jo Mark and Joe uh, worked equally on the illustrations. They are very collaborative, so they literally would work on the illustration and pass it to the other. So the final work is, is truly collaborative. And the third contributor to the story is Summer, their daughter. Um, so she was four years old when they were working on the story. And um, when we had our kickoff call, we talked a lot about why that first book didn't work and the concerns around uh, making the tick tick sweet, but not too scary and understandable. So they would show sketches to her and say, Summer, is she scary? And she'd say no. So they'd move ahead. And so this is the character sketch for Gamai that they did. And they really leaned into her being sweet and, and beautiful and um, didn't need to balance her being scary since she had a different character. So they thought of her long tongue as a ribbon and they brought nature elements into her skirt since she's a vegetarian. And I'm gonna just run through with the time I have left um, their final illustrations and show a couple audience, um, a couple reader reactions at the end. I think their work is really like paintings. So there were a lot of reactions to the final book. People love this book. It's of the series is the most popular one, especially in the Bay Area. Um, but two reactions I thought were really wonderful, um, and which brings us back to you know why is cultural equity important and why are diverse monsters important? Um, this is Georgina. She lives in Manila. She loves the story, um, and she posted on Instagram that she dressed up as a Mananungal for Halloween this year. Um, which is pretty unusual. Um, so I was really happy to see that. Um, and then this is something that came through when the books were published two years ago. A mom in Manila messaged me on Facebook and said, I read the story to my daughter and she was scared. And I thought, oh no, you know, I messed up on the second version too. And, um, but she um, turned that into a teaching moment. She's very woke mommy and she said, to her daughter, you know, the story is not real, but she turned it into a teaching moment about healthcare and said in the, the rural areas, um, sometimes people don't have access to doctors and healthcare and sometimes families lose babies. And so that's why the story is there to explain that. And so this little girl wrote a letter 
and said what you see here, which is, you know, hello, my name is Marion. My mom told me about the tick tick. I'm no longer scared of it, and now I'm more curious and want to learn more about it, um, which, you know, just wanted to cry <laughs> when I read that. Um, but I think that, in conclusion, this shows the value of cultural equity and why monsters are important, because um, they give us frameworks to understand and explain the inexplainable. And this also brings us back to that idea of the monster as a parenting tool. So that's it. Thank you for having me. And you can find me on the social media. Awesome.